Well, if you have a Bible or access to a device with a Bible app, turn to Revelation chapter two. I know you're shocked that uh, I would mention Revelation. I usually don't go there. And some of you wonder if I even know it's back there. Uh, I do. And uh, I had some time on a vacation to dig into a, a, a particular burden stirring in my own soul that I thought I better see what this is all about. What does this mean? And so I dug into uh, Revelations and I got to chapter two and I knew that's where I was headed. And it certainly proved to be something I was supposed to read and give thought to, think about, study, and then speak to you about it. There are seven churches mentioned in this text, in this, these uh, couple of chapters in uh, Revelations. Seven churches are mentioned. Now I'm gonna come back to the first one in a minute because that's really the one I think is most like, or, or most like us or would have a similar potential problem. But the second one mentioned is Smyrna. And let me just give you the quick synopsis of what the Lord was saying to these churches. Church of Smyrna, they said, you're gonna suffer incredible persecution. There are no problems for me to address. I have nothing to find wrong in you. I'm just hoping to encourage you because these are going to be some tough times ahead for you. So they were warned in advance, be ready. It's not going to be pleasant. Pergamum needed to repent. The, the angel says, the angel of the Lord says, you need to repent, you've become worldly, you've become tolerant of things that we must not tolerate as believers. They did not deny Christ, but they tolerated idol worship, they tolerated immorality, they tolerated cults. And, and the angel of the Lord Jesus is saying to them, you must repent you must turn around, you must change. To the next church, uh, Thyatira committed, they were committed, uh, commended for their love. They were a loving group of people, they had a great faith, they were serving one another like a great church always does. But, he says, but I have this, you tolerate a false prophetess among you who is okay with sexual immorality, who ignores Jewish laws, the punishment will be severe. On to the next church, Sardis, no positive words to say, nothing positive will come out of this. He says, you have a reputation of being alive. A repu Look at this, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains. What a warning. Philadelphia, a model church. It's, it's the church we all would hope to be. A model church, and I'm gonna bless you, the text says. I'm gonna bless you, because you're a model church. You're doing, you're focused on the right things, you're doing the right things, and you are lifting the name of Christ high, and for that, I will bless you. Number seven, the seventh church, Laodicea. Kind of a problem here. You're neither hot nor cold. How I wish you were one or the other. Those are strong words. How I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. I mean, that's God saying you're distasteful to me. Have the courage to be one or the other. But quit this pretend game of being just religious enough to maybe satisfy something either in you or some person that wants you to be a little more religious. No, 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 either be hot or be cold, but get honest here, have integrity. Since you're lukewarm, I'll just spit you out of my mouth. And, and this was a church where casual Christianity had caught up with them. A love for the worldly things had caught up with them. They'd lost their focus. But there's that first one that's mentioned in Revelation chapter two. I wanna come back to that. And if there's a danger for crossings, I think it's found probably in verses two through five in the second chapter of Revelation. I'll paraphrase it quickly. I know your deeds. I know your hard work and your perseverance. You cannot tolerate evil people. They're getting commended. They're getting applauded because they're doing some things right. Hard work, good deeds, you persevere. You, you do not tolerate evil people. You have tested those who claim to be spiritual and they're not. He comes back, says it again, you persevered. You're enduring hardships for my name. You have not grown weary. Sounds like Philadelphia to me. Sounds like another model church. But 
He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. You have left your first love. Verse five, it goes on and says, consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, the bright light of Christ would go dim. They would lose their status as a church. Pretty serious warning. And I guess this, when I read this, I was drawn to this at the time. I wasn't sure why. But when I read through this, and I read this, particularly this one about Ephesus, a strong church, and yet a stern warning, I thought, I, I would say, we at Crossings probably need to be reminded of, of this one. It sounds to me like some of the things we occasionally are wrestling with, and if we don't take it serious, we'll be getting a warning, and it'll be a dangerous moment and a sad moment for this church. Around the country, churches that are healthy are looking at churches that have closed for one reason or another, like we've been doing. But it, there's, some, there's some sadness in all that, because in most cases, those churches at one time were vibrant, great churches. They, they had a great impact in a community, communities large and small. A lot of church buildings are for sale these days. How awful would it be, and yet how easy it could happen, to be driving up Portland in Oklahoma City in 40 years, 30 years, and see this big old place for sale? Imagine trying to sell it. But it can happen. It can happen fast. William Barclay's commentary, it's, one, it's a great study commentary, not, for some, not necessarily so much in-depth study, but it really is a very practical application. And, and Barclay says of this church at Ephesus, orthodoxy had been achieved at the cost of fellowship. I think it's a very great hazard of Christianity, most of you would agree with this, that the longer someone has been a believer, the greater the risk for them to forget how they were led to become one. I think it's easy to forget the condition of our life before we met Jesus. If we're not careful, we can easily get out of balance. We forget what it felt like to feel the weight of our messed up lives. We forget there's still people all around us who live messed up lives like we once did. We forget that sometimes. We forget what it was like when we didn't know anybody around us. We forget what it was like to feel like you didn't know anything about the Bible and all these people around you seemed to be experts and they had really big Bibles and there were lots of notes in the margins, which is a good thing. We forget that many people out there have no clue what some of our favorite phrases or songs mean doesn't mean we quit singing them, but they just don't have a clue why we would sing about blood, for example. We know why we do that. And the more removed we get from our past, it's easy for us to be less and less concerned about people still trapped in their own dysfunction, their own rebellion, their own selfishly being their own God. And this is why we must not lose that first love that bright light of Christ that beamed into our life somewhere where we found out that we were forgiven, we didn't have to keep trying to measure up to God that was impossible to please, that we were loved with an everlasting love by Jesus, that God sent him as his son, God in flesh, to get this message to us at that particular time in history because we are loved and we are desired and God has bitter, better plans for us than we do for ourselves. It's easy to forget what that new news felt like. 
It's easy to get accustomed to church. You get comfortable in one. That's okay too. Not comfortable though spiritually, not comfortable in our attitude toward those who are still struggling. We can't get so comfortable we don't even care about them any longer. That's what was happening at Ephesus. They had great Bible studies. They studied truth, they knew truth, they, they put, put the truth up against the light of all kinds of things. They were into the truth. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. And don't, don't for a minute think that we're not committed to truth around here, we're committed to strong Bible teaching. Just look at that insert in your worship folder today. Uh, all, our, all our rooms have it about the variety of classes and opportunities there are in this church to study God's word, to grow up spiritually, and to deepen your faith. High commitment for us, you know that. But what can happen, like Barclay said, orthodoxy is achieved at the cost of love and fellowship I think the longer we go to church, it's easy to look at a church as a service, a religious service provider, or a Christianized country club, if you will. I'll attend, I'll pay my dues, Bible calls it a tithe. Many, many professing Jesus followers have no interest in the tithe, so we give our dues. We expect certain things as a result and it happens very slowly and is usually unintentional. It's not intended. We're creatures of habit. We live in a world that's going to try to give us everything we want exactly the way we want it. I mean, I'm getting to a point. I mean, it kind of started at Starbucks. Uh, one day, one of the grandsons was, they were playing pretend. They loved to play, play pretend. And one of them was playing pretend. And they were ordering. They were like they'd gone to Starbucks. And they'd been listening to what KK orders at Starbucks. I ordered a lot for her in the mornings when I go get coffee occasionally and I'll get it for both of us. I still have had to write it down. What is it you want now? I want a grande, skinny, decaf, vanilla. And I, I ordered that one day and, and the guy, literally the guy, I, I can tell you his name. He handed it through the window and said, here's your why bother. Here's your why bother. And I said, I know. I order Americano, couple of shots, add an extra one if you want to. Give me four, give me five. I'll take all that caffeine I can get. But I want the grandkids. They were over there going, well, I'm going to, and they were trying to articulate this. They were trying to order between their mom and their KK. They were making their order. I mean, we want everything custom made for us and the world's kind of dishing that up for us out there. And so what happens? We bring that idea in here. I mean, there's a day coming. I can see it. I'm going to pull up to a restaurant, a drive through and I want my suit. I want, to, I want to order my food a certain way. I want a gluten-free bun. I want cage-free chicken. I want organic lettuce, organic tomatoes, and sugar-free ketchup. <laughs> it's coming. It's crazy. And if we get our sandwich and it's not exactly what we ordered, you would think the earth has had a major earthquake. We're in a crisis point. We park the car. We run into there. This is not what I ordered. As if that is the biggest problem we're going to have today. And if we take a cue from the culture, what we get out there and what we expect out there will soon be expected in here. We gotta be careful. Well, why did churches lose their first love? I have a couple of thoughts on that. The first is what I would call, we become functional atheists. A functional atheist is someone who believes what I believe. We see the Bible the same way. We believe Jesus is God's son. We value perhaps the church and what a church can do for the lives of people. Who are, who are lost, and when they're found, they are forgiven, and what a church can do to meet the needs of a community. They believe all those things just like you and me, but they really don't apply any of it. It's segmented in their life as the Sunday thing we do. That's a functional atheist. You do the right things, but we don't change how we live. We don't diligently search the scriptures to see what kind of life God is calling us to live. What's it mean to be a Christ-centered person, as we frequently say around here? What does it mean to center our life on Jesus? It means we're going to live a life that looks a lot like Jesus. 
We're going to have the gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. We want that kind of life. We pray to the Spirit that the Spirit would help us have that fruit in our lives, but not a functional atheist. I think the second issue is sometimes we do look at the church as a private club. You join it, you pay your dues, and you get a product. You get something in return. I think a third reason is I think the church can become a religious version of DHS. It becomes a social justice provider. Nothing wrong with that. We do that. The Bible says go into this world and spread that gospel and tell the story and help the hurting and feed the hungry. It says that, but not at the expense of the first love. And sometimes another reason I think we lose our first love is oftentimes the church is simply viewed as just another charity. It's just another charitable organization. I'm supporting 10 of those, so to speak, and I'm, I'll support that one too, I guess. Those are attitudes that can cause a church or a person to forget the first love. Ephesus was a strong, mature church. They were doing a lot of good things, but there was one very serious problem. They had lost that spark, that fire, that love for Jesus, that passion to live for Jesus, to know Jesus, to be known as a Jesus follower. I'll be honest that over the last couple of years, we've had some tough discussions around my table uh, in our, in my, uh, with my team. We meet for a couple hours every Monday. And every, we do budgeting, you know, we get into the budgeting year and we are fierce about budgeting correctly, of spending correctly, of being careful. This is tithe money. Somebody gave this money for the use of God's work in a church. So we get real tedious when it comes to budgets. We have a wonderful leader in that area, Blake Baston. But we start looking at some of the things we're doing or we've been doing a long time. And I've started asking myself some questions. I've had this growing discomfort. This is a wonderful thing. Thousands showed up. It was a great party, but nobody came to Jesus. Does anybody remember when anybody came to Jesus because we do that? Well, surely there's somebody. D does anybody remember that somebody decided in, the, in our big party we threw in the middle of the week that to come to our church and to give us the privilege of doing life with them and being their church family, their spiritual family here on the earth? Do we know anybody that came and, and got involved with this because of that big party? And I'm, I'm being unkind. These, these, these things happen by incredibly gifted, called staff members who, who do the best they can, and they're always charging the hill, and they're always going to go as fast and as far as they can go because they love Jesus. And so the thing their passion is, sometimes we all get carried away. I do. We all do which I'd rather have that than somebody that's, you wonder if they've got a pulse, if they care. So I've been really convicted about that, that we needed to really be careful that we're not losing that first love. We're having a lot of fun. Everybody's happy. At the summit this week, I think it was Craig Rochelle, um, who made this statement, you cannot change the future without disturbing the present. I spend a lot of time very concerned about the future. Now, if I'm not careful, it bleeds over into worry and a lack of faith because I've got to trust God. It's in his hands, but I've got work to do. We all have work to do as believers in this decade and in this particular century, if we intend to see the gospel continuing to be carried forward into the future. And right now, it's not looking too good for us. We got a lot of work to do. When we built this building 21 years ago, the world was a very different place. 20 years ago, we'll be, we'll, I think we're 20 years old Labor Day weekend. Churches in those days were building cafeterias and gymnasiums and fitness centers and bookstores because they were sticking points and people would come to those places for those reasons. That's not the case any longer. We've known that for quite a while. We've made some changes because of that. So I, I look at this and I say, we're spending a whole lot of money and time and energy on some things that are phenomenal. Thousands show up, like I said. 
But is anybody getting saved? It's the old fashioned term I grew up with. Anybody finding Jesus? And we couldn't, surely someone has, we just couldn't remember who. And all this stuff that we do sometimes, and it's all good, we're not going to, don't, don't get me wrong, some of you think, oh Lord, we're getting ready to close down the church, we're not going to do anything through the week. No, 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 no. At least you know what is on my mind and what we often are being very careful with every dollar. 90, over 90% 90 of the people who visit our church come on the weekend. Maybe that's where we need to put more of our energy. Maybe we'd be more prepared for those folks who might visit the church. Maybe you'd be more inclined to invite someone to a church and we'd be ready for them. Not that we're not now. It's pretty good. You can't imagine it getting any better, I know. We exist to help people find and follow Jesus, to find him, to know him, to walk with him, to put him at the center of their life. That's why we exist. And then we exist to help people follow him, to disciple them and grow people in, their, in Bible studies and in things that we do so our faith might be strong and withstand, as the Bible says, the fiery darts that are shot at us by the evil one who'll do everything he can to take away our joy. This is why we exist, and that's our first love. He is our first love. And we will do anything, anything that would cause that light of our first love to dim. We will do anything to prevent that. That ought to be all of our attitude. We're going to make sure we don't lose our focus. We're going to make sure that because of things we do and invest our time and resources, somebody's coming to Jesus. And addicts are being set free. Marriages are being healed. People are finding out they, they are loved, not just by God, but by us. It's kind of like marriage. Kim and I, and, and this happens every summer in July, typically in Colorado, we celebrate our, our anniversary. And we, so we just celebrated 36 years. And so to celebrate those 36, um, we bought tickets. I bought some tickets to a concert uh, down on the west side of Denver uh, at his fabulous place called Red Rocks Theater. It, it's just, a, it is magical. It is just magical. I love music. I love concerts. And I, I've been so foolish about that and so in love with that stuff. I'm, I'm scheming. We could fly the nonstop flight to Denver, go to the concert, we probably have to spend the night, I mean, just to go hear music, I'm, you know, that's kind of silly, but Red Rocks, oh my, 10,000 seats sandwiched between these massive cliffs outside, up on a hill, looking out over the city of Denver, and the sun goes down, and you can see the lights of Denver, and you can see the big lake on the south end of Denver, and the moon's hanging out there in the sky. It was magical, listening to Nora Jones and her little jazzy voice, you know. We had friends with us, and we, we just had a great 36th anniversary. Being in Denver, you could just take a really deep breath and benefit from someone else's marijuana. <laughs> you, you didn't have to buy any. It's legal. I, it wasn't quite that bad, but <laughs> honestly, Kim and I have never had that stuff or been around it, so we smelled this stuff. We're saying to a friend or two, what is that? It's marijuana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it crossed my mind, you know. Okay, that's, I didn't mean to go there. That... Oh, Kim hates it when I go off script. She... She's been praying for 36 years. God, don't let everything he thinks come out his mouth. You know that. You've, you've heard that. Okay, so anyone married for a long time will tell you that there are times, if you're not careful, after a long period of time, you can take a marriage for granted. You get caught up in work, careers, paying bills, raising children, paying higher bills, new jobs or new promotions or new challenges. 
you volunteer at church and at the kids' school and you coach soccer and you do all these things that is not that unusual, certainly to young families. And it's easy to lose sight of that first love you had when you were dating. It's easy to neglect and protect that first love. I suggest to couples, never stop dating. Don't stop dating just because you get married. Keep dating. Because see, we're seeing so many people in their 25th or 30th year of marriage and the kids leave and the glue's gone and they'd lost their first love. And many of them can't figure out a way to build that bridge back to each other. You gotta take care of it. So it's typical of all of us who've been married a long time. We know that there are times or there have been seasons where we didn't quite pay enough attention. We got distracted, typically by the pressures of life. As we celebrated our 36th, we were mindful of how quickly time has passed and it keeps passing by us. And it certainly is making me treat each day a bit more importantly than when I thought I'd live forever. And with whatever days left, you have no interest in wasting them on petty complaints or selfishness. We don't want that first love spark to get lost or to go out, the fire to dim. Somewhere along the way, a couple became roommates instead of soulmates. And we have a multitude of options these days to choose from to destroy ourselves and destroy our relationships and destroy our families. But we must not lose sight of our first love. His name is Jesus. Kim and I were raised, we didn't know any different, but we built our marriage with Jesus at the middle, right at the center of it. I recommend it. Makes a marriage exponentially better. We will not be known by love unless we're first people of the first love. A church where love ceases can no longer function properly as a local expression of Christ's body. This is one of the offenses for which that lampstand can be moved from its place, for the light will go dim. It's a condition through which a church can ultimately cease to exist. Some churches die from lack of outreach, some lack of planning for the next generation, some a lack of courtesy to people they don't know. Some churches like the church in Ephesus may risk simply killing themselves off by how they treat others. They lost their first love. You must return to that first love. We must be people that will do what Jesus said to do and love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbors as ourselves, and that is not easy. I find it kind of feels like it's getting harder to do. It's messy, it's time consuming. There's a statement that Paul made in 2 Corinthians, I'll close with this. He said, now I'm coming to you, for he's talking to a church he's gonna visit, now I'm coming to you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, And he says this, I don't want what you have, I want you. And then he says, I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you. Even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. Could we take a cue from Paul here? I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you. Is there anybody in your life that you're saying that to? I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you. Even though at times it seems the more I love you, the less you love me. I will not give up. I want you to know that first love experience that Jesus can bring us. I want everybody to know that. And that's why we exist as a church. 
I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to do something a little different as we close our services today. I'm going to ask you to do something I've never asked you to do. <laughs> Some people are already heading for the doors. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to take a minute, minute and a half, and I'm going to trust that you're going to, with people around you, we're going to circle up or stand along each other and pray. I'm going to trust there's somebody near you that's willing to say the prayer. Somebody will speak up. We're a family. I know it's a big family, but I think it's time occasionally when we join our hands together around the table. So make your own table wherever you are. Say a, spend a little bit of time, just say a quick prayer. And then after you pray, feel free to leave the room. I'm going to ask the prayer teams to make their way to the front and they'll be down here for you to pray with if you should need anything. So here we go. Take a couple of minutes and find some folks around you and pray that we would not lose our first love.